Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Spoiler Warning Podcast. This is review number 642 with our review of Mank. I'm Christopher Schnazy. And I'm Stephen Miller. And if you're joining us for the first time, the Spoiler Warning Podcast is a weekly film review program. Each week on the show, we're going to dive in, debate, discuss, and argue over the latest films coming to a streaming platform near you. Um, here we're talking about the film Make, which came out on Netflix this past weekend. And uh, we're also going to have a review in the feeds after this um, of a little film called The Sound of Metal, or Sound of Metal, uh, which uh, premiered on Amazon Prime Video. Um, so it should be a fun conversation for both of these, hopefully. Um, but yeah, so to start off, this film, Mank, um, is centers around the, the, the writing of the script for Citizen Kane, which is widely held as the greatest film ever made um, by people who talk about film um, and that sort of stuff. So obviously, we can't dive into this film without talking about Citizen Kane and what our thoughts are on Citizen Kane. So Stephen Miller, my question to you is Citizen Kane great film or greatest film (laughs) (laughs) um i mean so my actual answer is i don't think there is such a thing as the greatest film like i think that the whole idea of there being one greatest film is just like an insane notion yeah Um, yeah. so if if there were this wouldn't be that for me like (laughs) it's been established pretty well that like my sensibilities i can appreciate a lot of things but i love like an emotional core i love the more like raw a thing is the more it tends to resonate for me um but my memory of citizen kane was that it was like an eat your vegetables type of movie a like this is great because you know it set omni focus for the first time and it's the first time things were pointed upward and you could see the ceiling and the cinematography blah 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 like all, all these reasons that make sense on paper but would not in like 2020 translate to wanting to watch it. Um, yeah. And what surprised me was how I thought totally well it held up as a movie, at, at least for me when I watched it, which was like five in the morning on a Friday, um, <laughs> it breezed by. Like I thought it was like, an extremely watchable movie and not in a like, this is an old timey movie where I need to like compensate for the fact that culture was different back then. Like I actually thought it held up very, very well. Um, I thought it looked really good. I think the nonlinear structure is cool. Um, and I think Orson Welles like, does a pretty damn good job of acting like a young person and an old angry man in a way that doesn't <laughs> feel super cheesy. Uh, so yeah, I was um, hot take. Citizen Kane is a good movie. <laughs> um, that was my my real takeaway. Greatest of all time. I, of movies that tend to get that title, I think I would believe Vertigo more than Citizen Kane. Like I think Hitchcock has something that like this movie doesn't in terms of like raw appeal and repeat viewing being rewarding, but it, it, it's a damn good movie. I was happy to rewatch it. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I think you probably enjoyed yourself in Citizen Kane more than I did. Um, Citizen Kane is definitely a film that you don't stumble upon on your own. You, you, you have to watch it probably in college at some point um, or because you're, you're, graduated and you call yourself a film buff and it's on the top of all these lists and you're like oh shit i haven't seen that yet so i gotta go see it right like i watched it in college um in like a film class that i took and you know i watched it and you take the class and you talk about what makes it great but it doesn't make it a film that i would return to all the time because i can academically watch citizen kane and be like oh okay so it's the first time all these things were used And it's doing all these things that were revolutionary in 1941 (laughs) when the film was released. And that's all fine and dandy, but it doesn't make the thing that I am going to like on a Saturday when I'm just like killing time, be like, you know what? I'm going to go put on Citizen Kane Um, because to me, it's not it's not that sort of it's not that sort of film. Like like it's it's a fun academic exercise to partake in it, but it's not it's not a film that I watch for fun. And, And for me personally, I think that I'm much more invested in Citizen Kane in the beginning where it's like all the news rule stuff and it's all the people wanting to go out and have these conversations. But when it comes down to it, I like some of those conversations that the, 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 the guy who's trying to figure out what the hell Rosebud is goes and has, there's no information there. It's just, it's like a glimpse at this moment in time. And for me that like, t- just to me, the further 
everybody aged in that film, <laughs> the less I cared about it. <laughs> and part of that is because maybe because, you know, I I've known the ending for many, many years or whatever. And like, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I don't know. Like I, I do, we we were talking jokingly um, before we sat down to watch any of these. Uh, whether or not we have to go back and watch Citizen Kane. And I jokingly told you a story about how, like, when I think about Citizen Kane, I think about uh, watching a riff tracks of the Matrix uh, Revolution or Reloaded, whichever one it was, and having, like, the riff tracks guys do a rosebud joke when, um, spoilers for that film, <laughs> when Trinity takes a bullet. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's like... If you say Citizen Kane, I think of this Rift Tracks moment, not the film or anything that it did. And then I secondarily go back to the film that I was supposed to watch back in the day. So, so yeah. And I think also I confess to you, I might as well say it on air. There was nothing about the trailer for Mank that made me get hyped for watching Mank. It was mostly like a thing where it was like, okay, this is doing a very specific thing and I'm going to watch it because it's like arguably the biggest thing that there is to watch this week and we're going to do a review yeah. of it. But I wasn't like, Oh yeah. Like if you would have told me like with, without any context, you're like, okay, there's a David Fincher co film coming out this weekend and it has a soundtrack by Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross. I would have been, fuck yeah, sign me up. And then if you showed me the trailer for Mank, I'd be like, Oh, that's not what I thought I was getting. <laughs> yep. Um, but yeah, that, that's just, that's, I'm putting all my cards out on the table before uh, we get into the actual review, but that's kind no, of like how no, I feel. No, I hear you. I'm, so I, I'm actually, I, I'm not surprised, but it, it, it's interesting that to you it still feels like an academic exercise because that, that's what I totally thought it was going to be like when I was watching it. Like I also remembered the movie being like three hours long, not like a tight hour <laughs> 45 or whatever it actually is. Um, but th like for me... I feel like it isn't just a snapshot into what was revolutionary in the 1940s. I feel like to get the kind of like moving camera and like clever transitions where like parts of the scene fade away and then others fade away later and stuff, you would have to jump forward into like way later in time. Like I feel like, I feel like this movie was doing things that it took like decades for filmmakers to feel confident enough to start doing again. And maybe yeah, that's yeah. more because Orson Welles was just such a like brash young dude making his first movie. And he was like, fuck it, I'm going to break all the rules. And then, <laughs> you know, we had another 20 or 30 years where most of the rules weren't broken again for a while. Yeah. yeah no, and, I, and, I, and I see all that and I can appreciate it, but it's like, it's hard to, it's like, for, for instance, when the matrix did bullet time, right? It was like, holy shit, bullet time is is ridiculous, right? Like, this is really, really cool. But how many times is bullet time used? All the times it was used, it was just Neo, like, going backwards or Neo and Smith jumping at each other. And when you look at those scenes now, you can appreciate it for how revolutionary it was at the time. But those scenes aren't, like... The other stuff, like the other wire food that's happening is way more impressive than the, the four seconds of film that are bullet time, right? It's just a thing right. where you, those don't stand out the same way they did at the time because your brain broke the first time you saw it. But now, like everything is done with virtual cameras and fully CG doubles and like all this kind of stuff. And that technology is getting better and better and better so that some of these things can be incredibly impressive. And it's just when you see the things that only exist now because of Citizen Kane you're still seeing a better execution of that because they have the technology to execute it better, right? It's, it's just, I don't know. It, it's a thing that, like, I can look at it and I can appreciate it, but I take it for granted now because I've had so many years of film since that film came out that I'm like, yeah, seen it. <laughs> yeah, and even, you know, The Matrix wasn't the first to do bullet time. It was actually a video game called uh, Citizen Pain. <laughs> that, was a good, that was a good joke. Nice. But I think Max Payne actually came out the year after The Matrix, so it wasn't yeah, yeah. that good. Yeah, well, now that everybody's turned off the podcast, <laughs> um, what do you say, Stephen? We get into our review of Mank. Let's do it. We're going to take a listen to the trailer for Mank, and then we're going to come back and give you all a review. Mank? It's Orson Welles. Of course it is. I think it's time we talk. What is it the writer says? Tell the story you know. 
God bless William Randolph Hearst. Ready and willing to hunt the great white whale? Just call me Ahab. Do come in. At this rate, you will never finish. You said 90 days. Well, said 60. I'm doing the best I can. I have put up with your suicidal drinking, your compulsive gambling, your silly platonic affairs. You owe me, Herman. Who do you think you are? You're nothing but a court jester. What I want to know is what you think of it. It's a bit of a jumble, the collection of fragments that leap around in time like Mexican jumping beans. Welcome to my mind, old sock. Him, I get. But what did Marion ever do to deserve it's this? It's not her. Not all characters are headliners. Some are secondary. You pick a fight with Willie. You are finished. Mayor can't save you. Nobody can. Especially the boy genius from New York. I removed any distraction, eliminated every excuse. Your family, your cronies, liquor. I gave you a second chance. You cannot capture a man's entire life in two hours. All you can hope is to leave the impression of what? Why Hurst? Outside his own blonde Betty Boop, you're always his favorite dinner partner. Are you familiar with the parable of the organ grinder's monkey? <laughs> All right. So that was the trailer for Mink. Um, it is basically the story of uh, a period of time in Hollywood in the 1930s when Herman Mankiewicz was writing uh, Citizen Kane. And it's sort of his view of Hollywood and the current state of it and what's going on and how he used that to form um, what would become the story of Citizen Kane. Stephen Miller, what did you think of Mink? Uh, so... Mank was one of those movies that I really enjoyed watching and I thought was technically very impressive, but it didn't have the sort of emotional core that that I am looking for. That Usually I try to build up to that kind of summary, but I feel like it's easier <laughs> to just say that up front. Like, Mank, Mank is very different for a David Fincher movie, and it's also different from like the ideal Steven movie <laughs> uh, to review, <laughs> but it, it did give me a lot to chew on. And I think watching Citizen Kane before it helps a lot in just like putting yourself in the mindset of that world and what that era was like. Um, especially for me, I watched Citizen Kane and then I went on like a Wikipedia deep dive for like an hour after watching it. And then the next day I watched Mank. So like I had done this whole deep dive about William Randolph Hearst and like the disputed authorship and all of that, uh, all of that fun stuff. Um, yeah. So the good. Uh, first, Gary Oldman is great. Um, it it kind of blows my mind every time he does one of these transformative roles, just how much he is able to like become whatever character he has to be. Like in this case, he can be a New York Jew, and like you don't even notice that he's British Gary Oldman, and he's not even changing the way he talks all that much but, but like what, it, what, if, what if he had to play a role where the character doesn't mumble <laughs> yeah that might be tough <laughs> at this point i don't know if i've heard him enunciate in in many years but i think he might still have it in him <laughs> um, but but yeah i mean he he's great and absorbing in this movie as a kind of like not totally misanthropic, like at least the, in the movie, Mank has certain principles, but he's certainly happy to self-destruct and be very like sarcastic and wry in his way toward those principles. Like he isn't trying to be a friendly guy, um, which again, kind of fits with other roles he's played <laughs> over the last few years. Um, <laughs> I think the the fun of the recreation of 1930s Hollywood is really, really cool. And this is coming from someone who I am no buff at all about like, Hollywood in the 30s or 40s like I don't I would not catch most of the movie references I don't know a ton about like pre-code film before that like I, I'm not that kind of buff but 
I feel like the period recreation is like extremely impressive and very fun to watch. Um, and the bits that surprised me, like I was expecting it to be a fun period piece and a recreation of old timey Hollywood and kind of a, it isn't like Hail Caesar, which is clearly a love letter to Hollywood. I think this is closer to like a hate letter to Hollywood. This <laughs> yeah. is like all the terrible things about Hollywood in that time and very little of the glamour, but there's still an enjoyment of it because the movie is like Mankiewicz is, which is like he can hate a thing and it's still very like enjoyable and almost loving, like watching the way he hates it, particularly like the way he is clever as he tears it down. And that, that's what I feel like the movie is for Hollywood too. Um, what I wasn't expecting was it to tie in politics in a way that is, I think very clever and very modern day in like the story of like Upton Sinclair's race for governor of California yeah. and like how he's painted by the, you know, the late thirties, early forties version of fake news media. <laughs> um, like that all I think is very, very clever. And that is not in a like Wikipedia description of citizen Kane. Like that is almost certainly a, that, that election really happened. The idea of that, being why Herman Mankiewicz wrote Citizen Kane, I think is a total fabrication from David Fincher. And I think like a really clever one, like it ties the story together in a nice way where it's about like disillusionment with Hollywood and how being the, being the dream factory can also make you be evil, right? Right. Can make you be self-absorbed and only craving power and like the terror of the power that you get when you control the media. Um, so I, I felt like that was a really fun surprise. I, I had no idea that was going to be a part of the movie, and it wound up being like a pretty major part, at least of, of their version of Manx's motivation. Um, and yeah, I just think all the side actors are really fun. Uh, Tywin Lannister, uh, he, he's a great <laughs> William Randolph Hearst. Um, I was really a big fan of who the character, who the actor who played Marion Davies, and I didn't realize until going to IMDb that it was Amanda Seyfried <laughs> because yeah. she like does totally become that Betty Boopish type character. Like she does not remind me of the actress at all. Um, yeah, I don't know. I I, I could go on, but I I want to hear what you think first. Basically, it's a movie. I don't love this movie, but I found it very enjoyable, and I think. Not every movie needs to have a heart for it to be worth praising. And in this case, I got a lot to praise out of this movie, even if I didn't walk away feeling that kind of deep love that maybe other movies we talked about tonight gave me. <laughs> um, so so here's the thing about this film, Mink. Um, you, you said that you think that watching Citizen Kane relatively close or period, but but mostly like within somewhat proximity to watching Mink is a big uh, imp, like it helps, it, it's a big benefit to watching this film. I would argue that is a requirement because mm. without, and like this film does not stand on its own in any way whatsoever. I think if you had never heard of Citizen Kane, you don't know what it is and you don't know anybody who was in it or anybody around the time that it was created. You don't know anything, no history relevance at all. And you just watch this film in a vacuum. It would make no sense except for like the political references that sort of align themselves with today. The stuff that you brought up, I think right. a absent of that sort of kind of trying to tie it to the, to today. And, and as you said, the disillusion, disillusionment and stuff like that outside of that, it's a bunch of characters who might as well be called like Bob and Bob too. Like it's, it's unimportant. Like, like um, Orson Welles shows up and he's sort of like his presence is like, I mean, in the trailer, they, they give him more like of this godly, like, yeah. like the film doesn't actually do that, but he's still this person who's calling him on the phone, but it might as well be like Seinfeld with George getting a call from, <laughs> from the owner of the team or whatever. And like yelling at him. Right. It, it's just, there's no context for who he is or why it's right. important. There, there is strong Steinbrenner vibe. <laughs> with this version of Orson Welles. Yeah, and, and like, that's fine and all, but like, this film is made, it like, co like the way this is a love letter um, or a hate letter to that time and to Citizen Kane, the way this is an homage to Citizen Kane is sort of, it stands in opposition to, say, the way that like Super 8 is an homage to E.T., right? Like, that yeah. film is doing the feelings of E.T. 
but it is its own self-contained story that makes sense on its own. And if you had no reference to early Spielberg stuff, like you would still watch Super 8 and go like, wow, that was a compelling story on its own. This story, one might argue, like Citizen Kane, isn't particularly compelling just on its own, right? It's, 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 it's the way it's being told that is interesting, and it's the way it is throwing back. To, like, like, I really enjoyed the fact that like, if you just close your eyes and watch this film, you're like, this is a film that was made <laughs> in the 30s and released in the 40s. Like, it feels right at home when you watch it. It has that same like, high contrast, like noir style kind of look to it. And there's all this stuff that it's doing that looks visually striking and feels like, damn, you nailed feeling like this is Citizen Kane. I, I, like, I enjoy that watching it. Um, and I maybe enjoy it more because unlike when I watched Citizen Kane, where I only have the context of everything that came after it, I'm now watching this film that came after it with the context of what it's trying to do. Right. And now it becomes impressive. Like all the things that didn't impress me watching Citizen Kane impress me watching it backwards. And it's like, that aspect of Mank is really entertaining. And I kind of like when I watched Citizen Kane, I really liked the introduction to all the characters and how we learn who they are through their introduction. But the longer I sit with them, the less I care about them because their, their plight in this film is not that entertaining to me. Like, this isn't a guy who has an idea and fights hard to be able to write a script. It's a guy who is an alcoholic who has a bum leg and he's already been hired to write the script and we're just seeing him hang out in his Airbnb <laughs> while he writes the script and flashes back to these moments in time that shape how he's writing these characters. And every time we get a new scene, I'm drawn in. And every time I'm like getting introduced to new characters who are all like oldie time characters, I'm excited and I'm drawn in. And then every time I flash back to them later, I, I, don't, I just don't care as much because the only thing, like, the, 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 char the character of William Randolph Hearst, like, he, it, it, everything about him that is anything at all is just a reference to Charles Foster Kane, right? It, it's he, his zoo on his own property and, like, all these things. Like, basically, it, it, it's, you're watching a film be reverse engineered in a film that is reverse engineering the yeah. film. Like it, it's the cyclic, cyclical loop of watching a film of a filmmaker aping a film that he's trying to homage, but everything is only there because it, it, it what did it, this film is a time paradox. <laughs> That's <laughs> what it is. No, no, it is. Well, well, and it, like an example of the paradox is a thing I was wondering when watching it is I wonder if the, the actors David Fincher cast to play certain people, particularly mayor of MGM, um, if he cast them to look like the real people or if he cast them to look like the Citizen Kane characters that he's implying Mankiewicz wrote Citizen Kane to skewer them over. Yeah. Um, and that's like the kind of loopy paradox. Like, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no <laughs> idea because this movie gets to come from the future and back project here is the real world that generated Citizen Kane and whether it's true or not does didn't even really matter to me anymore like it became that kind of loopy homage where it didn't really matter what what the reality on the ground was or not yeah yeah it's just, it's just one of those things where like I can't watch it and I can't like I kept thinking what would happen if you just like I assume that lots of people are going to watch this this weekend or did watch it this weekend and it's going to rise to the, to the top of the charts, the little top 10 things that are being watched on Netflix. And there will be people who will watch this with no context for what Citizen Kane is or when Citizen Kane is. And they're just going to be like, oh, cool, I'm going to watch this new black and white David Fincher film. And they're going to be so lost. And this film cares not whether you know what it's talking about. It's just doing its thing. And it's like there is nothing there other than the reference and like that sort of blows my mind that this is a film that is purely at it. Like this is distilled a reference to a thing at a time. And if you don't, if you don't know what that is, this film doesn't care if you're even interested in its characters because it's too busy showing off at what it's doing. <laughs> so what, what's interesting is I can't agree or disagree with that because I didn't give us the chance because we both did our homework and watched Citizen Kane right before watching this movie. Yeah. I want to say 
it, I would have lost something from not having had Kane fresh in my mind. I don't know if the movie wouldn't have made sense to me. Like, so here's the thing. The the synopsis of this movie is mostly a lie. Like, and the way the trailer pitches it, it, it is all selling it as if it were about the contested ownership of the script for Citizen Kane and like the the fight to have Mankiewicz's name on the script. That is not what this movie is about. That shows up like 20 minutes before the end of this movie as like, yeah. oh, by the way, he wanted his name on it. And oh, he got his name on it. You know, <laughs> like that, this movie does thing, too, not it, care about that at all. It's, lit- it's literally s- spoilers for Mank slash history. <laughs> it's basically he's hired to write this without credit because I guess that's what you do in the theater world is you just write shit in the theater group um yeah get, buys it and then they make it and then you don't get credit and he writes this thing in 60 days and then shows it to a bunch of people and they all say that's your greatest work and he's like shit <laughs> i'm not gonna get credit for this <laughs> and then like how like yeah it's just it, it's 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 just funny that he's like right at the end he's like oh and uh what about credit and then him and Orson Welles yell at each other and then he gets credit. Like, <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Like, like the movie does not care about that part. And that's why I feel like what it is really about is the, I mean, this is going to be very pat and obvious or whatever to say, but the movie is doing what Citizen Kane is doing, where it's <laughs> starting at the end and then it's like fading back over time in a way that isn't totally linearly like dropping into his past and using that to try to paint a portrait of how Mankiewicz became who he is at the moment. Like, how did he become this angry, drunk guy that wants to write this story? Um, I don't know how that would play if I hadn't seen Citizen Kane before. Like, would I just take this as the story of an author and the things that drive him? Like, I don't know. It, it's kind of impossible for me to say because I I have seen the movie. Well, um, so, I think so, it would still be entertaining. I don't know that it would make sense, but I think it would still be entertaining. Yeah, it would be entertaining in like the I don't know where this is going or why it's going sort of way. But like like the characters are still interesting people. This time is still an interesting time. But it's like the yeah. stakes are weird because you don't know what they are. Like, for instance, if characters randomly start stopping, dropping by his house and going like, so I read your script. Uh, is this me? Like, if you hadn't seen Citizen Kane you would have no context for why that person thinks that character is them, right? Like, no no right. reference, no reference at all. You'd just be like, that'd be weird. I mean, it's like if, 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 you, if you wrote a story and I read it and I was like, is this me? And you're like, why would that be you? <laughs> like, why am I writing a story about you, right? It's, it, feel, it would be like that equivalent sort of thing, right? Like, it would just be, mm-hmm. it, it just feels like the, that, per, that character can only think it's them because they know who they are. And we only know who they are because none of us, well, none of us on this podcast were alive <laughs> when this film was being made. But like the only reason that character knows who they are is because they're the character, not the actual person that character is based off of. So we are living where this film has to tell us who these people are. And because we never, there is one moment we see Gary Oldman dictating to the I don't remember exactly what her job was titled in the film but like the the yeah, woman who's Lily like Collins Phil Collins daughter yeah so so she is like transcribing as he's dictating and that is the only time we get stuff which at that point I don't even know if he started writing that yet or if he was writing another play for Ors- Orson Welles at the time um because I didn't recognize the dialogue itself um but that could just be because yeah, I didn't I, remember I think the dialogue. It's Kane. E- okay. Even though in reality he wrote something else for him first, but I think in this movie it's all Citizen Kane. Yeah, I think he wrote multiple plays in the span of that same time. But anyways, it's like we don't see what the story of Citizen Kane is. So in the film, we have no reference to seeing the Xanadu like stuff at <laughs> her property yep. like we don't we don't have any reference to who these characters are because we just see him writing and people ask him how close to being done he is so like they're like the only reason we can recognize these people is because we know who they are from having seen citizen kane so it's kind of yeah. like it's, it's a we it's not even a magic trick it's like a it's like a weird thing where you're like i'm only going to ever show this film to people who already care about it so I don't have to do any of the work to fill in the gaps for people who don't already have those gaps filled on their own. 
Yeah, like like I guess you could imagine a disaster artist version of this movie where it shows you them filming Citizen Kane and then you would start to pick up like what the eventual movie became based on this. But it is there is an interesting symmetry with the movie where Citizen Kane, like I knew just ambiently or whatever if from the culture that Citizen Kane was based off of William Randolph Hearst. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't care. I didn't know anything about William Randolph Hearst or why yeah. it mattered that this was skewering him. I knew, but I knew that. But so with Citizen Kane, you're watching a movie that is very specifically skewering one individual and a time in America, and you're only seeing the fiction that came from that. And this is doing the opposite, where you are only seeing the motivation and you're not seeing what it motivated, which it, it is a trick. You're right. I don't know if it's a magic trick. It is like a... It's a device that is really interesting. Yeah. Um, I do a little little bit of uh, trivia. Uh, so Orson Welles in this movie. So he's played by this guy, Tom Burke, actor. He's good. I, I don't know him from other things. Um, but in order to learn how to do the Orson Welles impression, he, David Fincher had uh, Maurice LaMarche, who's the voice of Brain in Pinky and the Brain, <laughs> <laughs> read all of his dialogue in his Orson Welles, Orson Welles, because Brain is basically an Orson Welles impression. Yeah. Um, he had this guy read all of the dialogue and record himself so Tom Burke could study it so he could learn, like, how would a, like, master impersonator enunciate. So he is basically Brain from Pinky and the Brain in this movie, <laughs> which, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, yeah, a another thing I just wanted to bring up is there is a big scene as long as we're on the subject of things referencing things we d aren't familiar with and whether they would still work, there's like a kind of pivotal scene in this movie toward the end where uh, Oldman's Mank goes on a long extended allegory to Don Quixote um, in the presence of William Randolph Hearst. And he talks all about the story of the man from La Mancha and all the things that happen and the sidekicks, like his troll sidekick and all this stuff. And even though I've never read Don Quixote, I do not know the story of Don Quixote. I thought that scene was brilliant. Like, I, I loved <laughs> that scene. And that is the same kind of magic trick it's pulling off where, like, I don't know the reference exactly. So I should not care whether it is sticking the landing in comparing these things. But the like the energy that he brings to that argument fills in the gap for me. Like, I, like, I don't know why it completely but, works for me. But the difference is in that scene, he is telling the story of Don Quixote, right? Like he is like, yeah, but drunkenly you, in his Gary Oldman slur, like yeah. I didn't catch the story of Don Quixote in that. But, but you are, you are watching him tell an actual story and then you're trying to figure out how that story applies to the scene that he's currently in. Right? Like that's what you're doing. What this film is doing is not telling you the story, but telling you how it applies and then not yep. showing you the story. It's like literally doing the opposite of that dinner scene. And it's like, I don't. How are you doing? Like, why are you doing like it's I mean, I get why you're doing it. Like, this is a personal take on this story. And it comes like, I don't think that you have to make films for everyone. Um, mm -hmm. When you release a film on Netflix, technically, Netflix thinks you're making films for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> but that's like that's a business conversation that I don't really care about. Like I, I'm I don't fault anybody for making this film or doing it the way they did. I'm just try like as as a watcher, I couldn't not think I only understand what's going on because I watched Citizen Kane and I couldn't help but think about like talk like see this in comparison to I don't know uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. If you look at that yeah. film, that film could stand alone. You could have no knowledge of any of the history surrounding the story that's being told, not understand the significance of the ending or any individual beat. And that is a really compelling narrative that is interesting on its own, that builds dread well, that has a bunch of things that are going on, has its entertainment, has its laughs, its cries, it has all this stuff. And then on top of that, if you know what it's drawing from, you know who Quentin Tarantino is, you know who he's cast in previous films, you know actors from other roles that they have played in unrelated material. It has all this extra stuff building on top of it. And it's like you get an extra joy that comes from it. This film is only that level of joy with a story that is absent from the context that you need to 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 watch it. Mm -hmm. So... I guess the question is, you are someone who watched Citizen Kane, so you do have the context. 
So how much does the fact that it wouldn't stand alone hurt your experience as someone who didn't have to have it stand alone? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that's the that's the honest that's the honest answer. Like I I enjoy it it's kind of like So so we we this I <laughs> I'm going to give you an analogy that only is going to work for you, which is beautiful podcasting work here but uh great love it you and i enjoy um dark beers uh really really heavy stouts high alcohol content and kind of like if you get a fresh like a, a brand new stout that you haven't tried before and it's like served you know it's draft uh it's the first time you're trying a beer back before covid hit um hanging out in mckellar uh great ambiance you pull up this beer and you, you can like see how thick it is. You're like, this is going to be the best beer I've ever tasted. And you take a sip and it's you only taste it like on the outside of your tongue. Like, you know what I'm talking yeah. about? Like it's missing the middle palate, the thing. Right. That, it's a porter. The, yeah. yeah. <laughs> nice. But it, it, it's missing the body that fills out that full flavor palette. And all you're getting is like this little bit of outside and an aftertaste from it. That is a beer that, like, as soon as it t touches your tongue, you're like, oh, this is amazing. And as soon as you've already swallowed that gulp, it's gone instantly. And you're like, I don't know what's I don't, I don't know. That's kind of how I feel about this film. It's like the performances are great. The 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 characters are all fun. I love the back and forth between them. I love watching Herman Mankiewicz do whatever it is that he's doing and just walk onto other people's sets and take it over. Like, there, there's a scene where he's like... He's kind of in the shot. I mean, he's not in the shot, but they're using her dialogue. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, and he's just smoking. I, I love, by the way, just that visual of smoking on a pyre while someone's being burned at the stake. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty great. Uh, likewise, the scene that he tries to light a cigarette in a roaring fire. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so so th there's lots of things where it's like, I enjoy, like, I enjoy the journey of watching all this, but I couldn't help but wonder why i was watching it other than to like it's it's clear that everybody involved in this cares about citizen kane what this film doesn't do is make me care about citizen kane so i watch i get all like i kind of said it already but i get all the academic praise of citizen kane through watching this try to do that and i go like yeah. shit this film is really doing that well <laughs> and i like it makes me want to clap for it but I don't know that it's a thing that I will remember next week when we watch the next thing that we're going to watch. Right. It's just a thing. Like I did watch this. This is not going to make any of my list at the end of the year. Um, well, who knows there <laughs> like with the way things are going, maybe through process of elimination, it'll be a reverse <laughs> list where it somehow makes it into the top 10 because there's too many other things that I drop off of it. Um, yeah, that's mostly a joke, but, uh, but yeah, I, I had fun with it. I don't, I mean, I, I didn't expect to like it and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed watching it. Um, but by the end, I kind of was like, thanks for the history lesson. <laughs> you know what I mean? See, so, so I'm going to take your drink analogy and I'm going to do another drink analogy that will only really make sense to us, <laughs> which is when we were in New York for Tribeca, uh, a few years ago, we went to this brunch place oh, uh, so good. that had like <laughs> amazing French dips. Um, and I had a deconstructed cocktail there where it came in two pieces where one was like a scotch bit and another was this like spicy pickle bit. And you were supposed to take sips alternating of the two of them and that would make the cocktail. And this movie pairs with another movie. And I think watching them back to back it makes the total experience be something that one movie wouldn't do for you and that is really interesting to me like a movie that is commenting on another one and they prop each other up um and so i think there there is value to that that is i'm not going to say it's more than the sum of its parts but it, it is different than the sum of its parts and i think that that was unique and i i liked it for that i don't know if i've ever seen another movie that is so much about a movie before yeah and there's a funny thing too that is that is kind of interesting like i'm i'm going to continue to talk out of my ass um but why stop now um so citizen kane 
everybody now talks about it as the greatest film of all time. The year it came out, it won one single award, which is significant yeah. to the existence of this film, and that was for best screenplay. When people talk about Citizen Kane, they talk about it less about the screenplay and kind of more about what it was doing as a whole, the filmmaking techniques, how it did its transitions, how it did this and that. Like it talks about the filmmaking, not the writing right. of the film. This is a film that is probably going to win technical awards <laughs> and not win best screenplay. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. and it's just funny to, to see like this cyclical loop will continue um that that is funny <laughs> <laughs> that that is a funny thought though frankly i don't know what is going to win best screenplay this year so it has a shot oh yeah tr true i mean it, it definitely can't rule it out but it's just kind of funny that that like just the way that has worked <laughs> i think this was also a script that David Fincher's dad started writing like, yeah. many years ago and he finished. So even, even in the making of this movie, there's this interesting like generational history thing happening. Yeah. Cool. Um, so shall we do the difficult job of actually trying to give a verdict to this film? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Steven Miller. If you were going to even say must see, a record with a caveat, a wait for rental, a pass with a caveat, or a must avoid, what would you give it? This is a movie that should be recommended with a caveat for me, but by the sheer power of the technical skill involved in making it and the fun I had watching it, it became a must see. I think it does not, as far as I'm concerned, have a heart. It doesn't have that through line that I almost always want. It doesn't have the body of the stout, you know, in, in your analogy. <laughs> but I, I just really, really, really enjoyed what it was doing. And I, I was really happy to watch it. And I think it's a movie that anyone who likes movies should seek it out and watch it because I think you're going to get something from it. Yeah, th this is <laughs> most of the time. So I'm going to give it a recommend with a caveat as well. Most of the time, the caveat is a thing that bumps it down. My caveat is going to be a thing that's holding it up. <laughs> I recommend this film. The caveat is you have to watch Citizen Kane. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, just to be clear, by the way, mine was a must-see. It would have been a caveat, yeah, but yeah, I yeah, bumped yeah. it to a must-see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yours, yours is a must-see. I've given you a record of the caveat. Caveat being you must also double feature it and watch citizen game yeah so you're saying the caveat is a thing that holds it up and keeps it from falling down like a cane yeah <laughs> your audio cool. cut out but <laughs> i still i still got Filled the cane the reference yeah yeah I, I, I picked up on the joke <laughs> see you didn't need the original in order to know what it was referencing and still get joy out of it <laughs> touche steven touche all right well that is gonna do it for our review of mank make us and kane or citizen mank <laughs> um steven miller people want to find you throughout the week where can they do that uh people can find me at twitter.com slash s david miller or s david miller.com people can find me at christopher in real life.com or twitter.com slash christopher irl you can find the podcast over at the spoiler warning.com where you can get a bunch of the back episodes of the show if you want to subscribe to the show you can do so on overcast stitcher apple podcasts or wherever podcasts are found if you want to know the episodes go live you can follow us at twitter.com slash spoiler warning facebook.com slash the spoiler warning or instagram.com slash the spoiler warning if you want to get hold of us directly you can send an email to fans at the spoiler warning.com or you can use the contact form on our site music for this episode will come from the soundtrack to make so hopefully you are enjoying that um yep we have to go uh take off right now and hopefully keep our hearing as we record a review of sound of metal so see you then bye bye